With a fee fi fo and a hey and a ho And a fiddle and a diddle and a rhyme The tale you're gonna hear happened such a long time ago Once upon a time Once upon a time This is the story of Jack and the Beanstalk. Once upon a time, there was a lazy boy called Jack. You're so lazy, said his mother Lily. You never help around the house and you never earn any money to help pay your keep. Uh, sorry, Mum, I'll try harder, said Jack. I should think so too. And you can start by going off to market and selling our cow. All right, Mum, all right. I'll do it right away, exclaimed Jack. And make sure you get an excellent price, shouted Lily. As Jack was leading the cow to market, he met a strange little man with a huge grey beard and a crooked walking stick. Oh, hello, young man. If you give me that cow, I'll give you something very special in return. And he produced a handful of beans from his pocket. Uh, what are those, mate? asked Jack. These, sir, are magic beans. They have very powerful qualities. Very powerful qualities? I like the sound of that. You've got yourself a deal, old man. When Jack returned to his mother with just a handful of beans and no cow, she went absolutely ballistic. You idiot, she screamed. Not only are you an idle imbecile, you'll also appear to be completely stupid. Then Lily grabbed the beans from Jack's hand and hurled them out of the window before breaking down in tears of despair. Oh, Jack, oh, Jack, how did you turn out like this? If your father was alive today, he'd be turning in his grave. When Jack woke up the next morning, he ate his breakfast and went for a sad stroll in the garden. When he saw what was growing near the window where his mother had thrown the beans, Jack couldn't believe his eyes. A massive beanstalk had grown so high that it reached into the sky. In fact, it was so tall that it disappeared into the clouds. Oh, my word, said Jack. The old man wasn't lying. They certainly are magic beans. Feeling adventurous, Jack climbed the beanstalk, and when he got to the top, he found a strange desert island situated just above the clouds. On the island was a massive house with a huge wooden door. Oh, I think I'm going to find out who lives in there. It's getting a little dark and I need somewhere to sleep, thought Jack. When he knocked the door, an old woman greeted him. Oh, you must leave at once, said the old woman. For if you stay, my husband will eat you up as he is a giant ogre who loves gobbling up little boys. Oh, no, said Jack. I don't like the sound of that, but I'm very tired and I've nowhere else to go. Oh, well, you better sneak in then, whispered the kindly old lady, and she introduced herself as Maud. The old lady took Jack into the kitchen and gave him a slice of slightly mouldy lemon meringue pie. As he began to eat it, the floor started to rumble. Oh dear, explained the old lady. It's my giant ogre husband, Herbert. He's woken up from his sleep. Oh no, cried Jack. Maud heaved up the lid of a giant bread bin. Quick, quick young man, hide in here and don't utter a word. Shh, 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 ma. Just as she closed the lid, the evil giant ogre entered the kitchen. Fiddly diddly fi fo fum, I sense that a little boy has come. Fee fi fo fum, flim flam flu, I'll crush his bones so to make a stew. <laughs> What's cooking, old hag? roared the giant ogre. Uh, what you can smell is a broth I'm cooking. I'm trying out a new recipe, you see. It was going to be a surprise, so I hope you like it. Give me five minutes and I'll serve it to you, said Maud to the ogre. Very well. 
I'll be back in ten minutes while you prepare this new dish of yours. And it had better be good, woman, or I shall have one of my notorious tantrums. As he left the kitchen, Maud quickly rustled up a broth on the stove using turnips, carrots, eyes of parrots, butterflies, snails and puppy dog tails. When the giant ogre came back, he devoured the entire meal in a matter of seconds. That was hardly a wonderful surprise. Bring me my golden goose at once, woman. Oh, very well, replied Maud. I'm sorry you didn't enjoy the meal. Just do as you're told, and bring me my goose, shouted the ogre. Oh, okay, said his nervous wife as she scurried off to fetch his goose. When Maud returned, Herbert grabbed the goose from her. He fixed his stare straight into the petrified bird's eyes and he shouted, Fee-fi-fiddly-fow, lay your master a golden egg now! Jack, who was peering under the lid of the bread bin, was amazed to see the goose produce an egg that was made of solid gold. And a minute later, on the ogre's orders, it laid no less than 12 golden eggs. <laughs> laughed Herbert. I love being mega rich. Now I need to sleep off that awful meal. Come with me and prepare my hot water bottle at once, old woman. He barked. Once Herbert and Maud had left, Jack leapt from the bread bin and he stuffed his pockets with the twelve golden eggs. Then he picked up the goose and he ran out of the house as fast as his legs would carry him until he reached the beanstalk and he started to climb down. When he reached the bottom, Jack presented his mother with the goose along with the twelve golden eggs. I told you those beans were magic, said Jack. Well, you're right on this occasion, replied his mother. And I know that goose because it was stolen from your late father by a wicked giant ogre many moons ago. From then on, the goose's ability to lay golden eggs made Jack and his mother very, very wealthy indeed. But Jack remained a curious kind of boy. One day, as he strolled in the garden near the beanstalk, he felt the urge to climb to the top once more and visit the island again. As he trundled across the sand, he bumped into Maud. What brings you back here? She inquired, with an element of surprise in her voice. Curiosity, said Jack. My mum tells me your husband stole that goose from my dad. I had a feeling it was your father, said the little old lady. Herbert's a very, very wicked old ogre. Where's Herbert now? asked Jack. He's out searching for that goose, replied Maud. What's more, he blames me for leaving the kitchen door open. I knew you'd taken the goose, but I don't begrudge you now that I know for sure Herbert had stolen it from your father. Maud took Jack into the kitchen and served him up some leftovers from another broth she had made for the giant ogre. Yeah, yeah the ogre's correct about her cooking thought Jack, as he discreetly spat out a spindly spider in an earwig. But I shall be polite, and I shall eat it just a little bit. Oh, how was my special broth? inquired Maud. Oh, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was delicious, but I I'm afraid I couldn't eat any more, replied Jack. Then, suddenly, there was a familiar rumbling sound as the giant ogre entered the house. Fee-fi-fiddly-foy, I smell the blood of an English boy. Be he from Peckham, Carl Shulton, or Narnia, I'll crush up his body and make a lasagna. <laughs> Once more, Jack found himself hiding in the bread bin. As Herbert entered the kitchen, Maud begged him to calm down. Oh, no, not that awful dish again, bellowed Herbert as he sat down and finished off the remnants of Jack's repugnant supper. Then he let out a huge belch and hollered. 
That was absolutely disgusting, woman. Now fetch me my money bags. I want to count my gold coins. A petrified Maud left the kitchen and came back with several money bags. As Herbert counted his gold coins, he laughed out loudly. <laughs> I may not have that prize goose anymore, but I am still extremely rich. Then Herbert the giant ogre fell asleep in his chair, leaving the money bags on the kitchen table. I believe he stole his money bags from your father as well, for I know it came from the same person that owned the goose, whispered Maud. You'd better take the coins and leave as fast as you can. Oh dear, these bags are quite heavy. I'll have to help you carry them. When they got as far as the beanstalk, they heard the roaring voice of the giant ogre. Fee, fi, fo, fum! I have a plan, for I smell the blood of an Englishman. And now my wife has betrayed me too. I'll mince them both up for a mighty fine stew. <laughs> Precariously, Maud and Jack managed to slither down the beanstalk, holding the bags of gold in their arms. But Herbert the giant ogre was following them. When I catch you, I'm going to gobble you both up, he snarled. But as soon as Jack and Maud got to the bottom of the beanstalk, Jack's mother, Lily, was waiting with an axe. She chopped the beanstalk down, causing Herbert to fall head first. He screamed before he met a prickly end as he smashed through the greenhouse in the garden, sticking to a cactus. Well, that's the end of that silly Herbert, said Lily. Hey, Mum, I'd like you to meet my special friend, Maud. She's been so helpful to us, said Jack. Lily thanked Maud for all her help and invited her to stay as long as she liked. As long as she don't cook any more broth, laughed Jack. Cheeky young man, said Maud. And they all lived happily ever after. And a hey and a ho And a fiddle and a diddle and a rhyme The tale you're gonna hear happened such a long time ago Once upon a time Once upon a time This is the story of Hansel and Gretel Once upon a time there was a poor widower Who had two children called Hansel and Gretel his name was Baron von Spendthrift, and he had frittered away his fortune. And although he was reduced to living in a tumble-down cottage, he did his best to look after his beloved son and daughter, Hansel and Gretel. He managed to feed them by working as a humble woodcutter. One morning at breakfast, the Baron announced to Hansel and Gretel that he was going to be married again. When he introduced his fiancée to the children, they found her a little frosty. Her name was Claudine, and although quite attractive, her mouth looked cruel, and she was very unfriendly to Hansel and Gretel. Although Claudine was aware that her husband was impoverished, she relished the idea of being a baroness. Once she had married Baron von Spendthrift, Claudine started to boss her stepchildren around in a way which was both unnecessary and very unpleasant. Gretel, you're not doing enough work around the house. I want you to scrub all the doorknobs and make them look all shiny and new. And as for you, Hansel, you are a lazy little urchin and you eat far too much. I want you to sweep all the floors and stop being so greedy and stop eating all the food from the larder. Your father doesn't earn enough for you to eat that much, she snarled. 
One night, when Hansel and Gretel were playing with their toys in the spare room of the tumble-down cottage, they overheard Claudine saying something very alarming to their beloved father. I can't stand your children, she said. They are so uncouth. They smell, they're lazy, and we simply can't afford to keep them here with the money you earn. What are you suggesting, my love? inquired a concerned baron. It is quite simple, said Claudine. I suggest that we take them over the fields and far away until we come to the great forest. <laughs> and then we'll pretend we are taking them on a picnic. <laughs> but then, then we'll leave them to fend for themselves. <laughs> They'll never be able to find their way home. <laughs> and then we will be free from those little pests. The Baron protested, as he loved his children very much. It would break my heart to lose them, he said. Put it this way, said Claudine. If you don't go along with my plan, I will leave you, and you will remain a lonely old man for the rest of your life. Although the Baron was kind, he was also weak, and he finally agreed to Claudine's wicked plan. Meanwhile, in the spare room, Gretel was panicking. Oh, what are we going to do? We are going to be abandoned. Don't worry, said Hansel, who'd had a private education in England. As we make our way to the great forest, I shall make a pathway with some white walks. Then we'll be able to follow the walks until we find our way home. The next day, with a smarmy look on her face, Claudine announced that they were all going out on a lovely family picnic. I have packed some delicious food in the hamper, she said. We have the cheese, bread, sausages, chocolate and of course the ice cream. It's time we had a lovely family day out so we can all bond together. <laughs> I can't think of anywhere better to have a picnic than the great forest. When they got to the forest, Hansel and Gretel opened the hamper to find nothing more than a couple of stale biscuits. She even lied about the food in the hamper, cried Gretel. She is one nasty piece of work, said Hansel, who then pointed out that their father and stepmother had slipped away without a buy your leave. However, they were able to find their way back to their father's house due to the trail of rocks Hansel had created whilst on their way through the forest. The Baron was thrilled to see Hansel and Gretel. The Baroness, on the other hand, was very, very angry indeed. How did you manage to find your way home, you little wretches? she rasped. Hansel left a trail of rocks, blurted out Gretel. You won't be doing that again, you nasty little urchins, said Claudine. Then she sent them to their bedroom and locked the door. We must take them back to the great forest tomorrow, said Claudine to the Baron. This time we will make sure that they don't have any rocks so they can make a trail that leads them back here to the house. Oh, I don't feel really comfortable about this. I love my children, said Baron von Spendthrift. If you don't go along with my plans, I am going to leave you, and I am going to make sure that I get the marital home. <laughs> Laughed his wicked, scheming wife. The Baron was extremely anxious, and when she saw this, Claudine started to turn on the charm. Think about it this way, she said. Hansel and Gretel are too pampered here. Out there in the great forest, they can learn about survival. We'll be doing them a favor. <laughs> All right, said the Baron. I'll go along with your plan, but I do love my children. The next day, they took Hansel and Gretel to the forest on the promise that they were going for a barbecue. Claudine built a fire and cooked a couple of mouldy old sausages that she'd found in the pantry of the tumble-down cottage. Keep your eye on those sausages whilst your father and I go on a romantic stroll, she said to the children. 
Within minutes, the Baron and Claudine had left them stranded in the forest. Don't worry, said Hansel. Do you remember the dry biscuits from the hamper last time they left us here? Yes, of course, said Gretel. Well, I've used them to leave a trail so we can find our way home, said Hansel in his best English accent. Oh, you're so clever, said Gretel. Unfortunately, Hansel and Gretel found the trail of biscuit crumbs had gone, for the birds had swooped down and eaten them all. Oh, dash it, said Hansel. I'm afraid to say we're completely lost in the great forest. Then Gretel spotted an odd-looking house, and as they walked towards it, they noticed the walls were made of marzipan, and each window was made of sugar. Oh, look, Hansel, what a bit of luck. I'm starving, said Gretel. Without hesitation, she started tucking into the marzipan wall. Mmm, this is so yummy, said Gretel. Yes, so are these sugary windows, said Hansel. Suddenly, an old hook-nosed woman appeared from behind an oak tree. Why are you eating my house? she asked. Oh, we're terribly sorry, said Gretel. We were very hungry and we'd got lost in the great forest. We simply couldn't resist it. That's okay, said the old woman. If you come inside my house, we can have some of my famous apple pie. It's very filling. I'll also make you a lovely pot of tea. Once Hansel and Gretel had some apple pie and tea, the old woman offered them a bed for the night. As they lay in bed, Hansel said, What a kind woman, so unlike Claudine. I agree, said Gretel. But little did they know that the old woman was a witch called Wei, who simply loved eating children. In the morning at breakfast, she produced a magic wand, and she waved it and said, Rosemary, parsley, pancetta and sage, have this boy locked in a rusty old cage. And in a flash of yellow smoke, Hansel found himself trapped in a rusty old cage. Oh no! I'm trapped! Trapped! <laughs> For the next few weeks, she bullied Gretel into helping her force-feed Hansel massive portions of her sickly apple pie. <laughs> Soon your brother will be fat enough to gobble up. I think I'll roast him with parsnips. Mmm, yum, yum, yum. One morning, which way took one look at Hansel and decided he was fat enough to be roasted in the oven with the parsnips she had freshly prepared from her garden. She turned on the oven and said, <laughs> Once this oven's hot enough, in he goes. I'm going to slow cook him. Gas mark four. I love it when children fall off the bone. But when the witch opened up the oven to check it was hot enough, a quick-thinking Gretel pushed her in and slammed the door. Help! Yelled which way? Let me out! No way! said Hansel, shouting from the cage. You're going to be slow cooked now, you wicked old witch. Then Gretel picked up the witch's magic wand along with a spell book, and after studying the spells, Gretel was able to wave the magic wand and say, By the eye of a troll and the nose of a gnome, may this magical spell take us safely back home. And sure enough, there was a huge puff of red and green smoke. And once the smoke had disappeared, Hansel and Gretel found themselves safely back in their father's tumble-down cottage. What are you doing back here? said Claudine. But their father was so thrilled to see them that he wept tears of joy. <laughs> That's it, said Claudine. I'm going to drag you both by the hair and take you back to the great forest. <laughs> no, you're not, said Gretel, and she waved her magic wand once more, saying, By the eye of a cat and the tail of a deer, it's time to make wicked Claudine disappear. 
And sure enough, Claudine disappeared into thin air. Good riddance to her, said Baron von Spendthrift. I'm so delighted that you are safe. I'm so sorry I was so weak. I forgive you, Daddykins, said Hansel. And so do I, said Gretel. And now I have another little surprise. She waved the magic wand and exclaimed, If I may be so decidedly bold, produce for my father a huge pot of gold. And sure enough, in a puff of crimson smoke, a massive pot of gold coins appeared. Thank you so much, children, said the Baron. We'll never have to struggle again. From that day on, Baron von Spendthrift and his children, Hansel and Gretel, lived happily ever after in a beautiful castle on a hill that overlooked the Great Forest. You're gonna hear happened such a long time ago Once upon a time Once upon a time This is the story of Rapunzel. Once upon a time there lived a man called David Peckham who lived with his wife Victoria on a picturesque farm in a beautiful little village called Sunny Hampton. They had a happy life and were very, very popular amongst their neighbours. The only thing that made this doting couple sad was that they didn't have a child. At the back of the garden was a high wall. Although the wall was vast and went right through Sunnyhampton, no one had ever dared to climb it, for the land behind belonged to the wicked witch Imelda. One day, Victoria noticed there was a crack in the wall, and as she peered through, she saw a row of trees bearing the most delicious apple she had ever seen. Cool, they look scrumptious, she whispered to herself. From that day on, for many weeks, she spent hours looking through the crack in the wall, dreaming of tasting the magnificent-looking apples. Every day, Victoria cooked for David, but could eat nothing herself. You must eat something, dear, said David. You're looking very, very thin and pale. i tell you what I want, what I really, really want. I want to have some of them apples in which Melder's garden, said Victoria, with a look of desperation in her eyes. Then I'd better scale a wall and fetch some of these apples for you, said David. That very night, when the clock struck twelve, David climbed the wall and he entered... And Elder's garden. He gathered the apples from the trees and when he got home he gave Victoria the bag of apples and she devoured them instantly. Oh my, <coughs> said Victoria. These apples were even better than I'd anticipated. The next day at midnight David scaled the wall once again and entered in Elder's garden. Suddenly from behind the trees which appeared. What do you think you are doing trespassing on my land? I knew it was you stealing the apples last night, she rasped. However, Imelda became more sympathetic when David explained how his wife had become obsessed with the apples. Okay. I won't put a curse on you, said the Melda. You can take as many of the apples as you like, but when your wife has a child, the child will become mine. You will bring the child to me. 
A frightened David agreed, and he quickly took another sack of apples back to his wife. Years later, Victoria gave birth to their first child. <coughs> then Imelda suddenly appeared. Claim the child for herself, much to the heartbreak of David and Victoria. Imelda the witch called the child Rapunzel, and she grew up into a beautiful girl with long blonde flowing hair. When Rapunzel reached the age of 14, the witch took her to the top of a tower in a remote woodland area. There was one small window at the top, but the witch bricked in the door to stop Rapunzel escaping. When Imelda came to bring food and water, poor Rapunzel was forced to let her long golden plait dangle out of the window, right down to the floor, so the witch could use her hair to climb the wall. A few years passed, and one day a handsome prince riding a black stallion was passing, when he heard the sound of Rapunzel singing. <laughs> The prince, whose name was Ernest, fell in love with the sweet sound of Rapunzel's voice coming from the top of the tower singing a beautiful lullaby. But then he saw Witch Imelda approaching the tower, so he hid behind a bush to watch. Prince Ernest was amazed when he heard Imelda cackle. Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair! And when the beautiful golden plaid tumbled from the window, the prince was amazed to see the old witch use it as a rope to scramble up the wall. Well, the next day when the prince approached the tower, he too shouted out, uh, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, uh, let down your hair. As the plaited hair came tumbling down the wall, Prince Ernest used it to climb up to the window. Rapunzel was delighted to see the handsome prince standing there instead of the witch, and as he stepped into the room, he told her how he admired her beautiful singing. Ernest's visits became more frequent. By and by, the two of them fell in love. I have a plan, said Rapunzel one day. Each time you visit, bring a piece of silk. We can weave the pieces of silk together to make a rope, and when it's long enough, I can climb down the wall of the tower to spend the rest of my life with you. Prince Ernest's visits continued, and the silk ladder they wove became longer and longer. However, one day, as the prince left the tower, he was seen by the evil witch Imelda, and she was furious. <laughs> You have been intruding on my property, young man, and you have been visiting my beloved daughter. You may look like a prince, but not for much longer, <laughs> she said whilst producing a magic wand. She waved the wand in the air and cackled. No magic trick will save your soul, for now you are a dwarf-like troll. <laughs> Within seconds, poor Prince Ernest had been transformed into a tiny, ugly, dwarf-like troll. And petrified of the witch, he ran into the forest and took refuge in a dark and dingy cave. Oh, 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 oh. what am I going to do? I've been cursed, cried the prince in his new dwarf-like voice. I'm sure I'm destined to die here in this gloomy cave. Meanwhile, Imelda confronted Rapunzel. I will make you pay for betraying me, Rapunzel, and letting another person into your world. She took Rapunzel to a dark and sinister Everglade that was surrounded by dangerous animals, such as bears and bats with huge white fangs. For months on end, poor Rapunzel wandered around the woods, living on her wits and eating fruit and wild mushrooms. Then, one day, she passed the cave where the poor prince had taken refuge. It was here she heard the sound of a dwarf sobbing. When she entered the cave, Rapunzel found the sobbing dwarf, and she recognised the clothes he was wearing. 
she knew straight away that he was none other than her prince. Prince Ernest looked up and was astonished and delighted to see Rapunzel. Rapunzel, Rapunzel, it's me, it's me, the prince. I've loved you from the day I set eyes on you, and I always will. The two of them embraced, and as Rapunzel kissed him gently on the cheek, the witch's spell was broken, and Prince Ernest suddenly regained his handsome looks and his princely voice. Rapunzel was reunited with her doting parents, David and Victoria Peckham, and she and the prince set a date for their wedding. As for Witch Imelda, she was so dumbfounded at the news of the couple's wedding that she began to lose the will to live. Under Prince Ernest's instruction, a spell was put on Imelda by a royal druid that turned her into a harmless but ugly toad. With her dark heart in pieces, she hopped into a nearby pond and was never seen again. Ribbit, ribbit. And a hey and a ho And a fiddle and a diddle and a rhyme The tale you're gonna hear happened such a long time ago Once upon a time Once upon a time The Adventures of Alice in Wonderland Once upon a time in Middle England There lived a pretty young girl called Alice one day, Alice was walking across a field when she came across an unusually large rabbit hole. As curiosity got the better of her, she stopped in her tracks and she peered down the hole. <coughs> Can I help you? Why are you looking down my rabbit hole? inquired a voice from behind. Alice looked round and she was alarmed to see a large white rabbit standing behind her. He was wearing a black and white pinstriped suit and over his left eye he had a monocle and in his right paw he held a long black walking stick. Oh, hello, said Alice. I, I just couldn't resist peering down the rabbit hole. I've never seen one so large. And what, pray, is your name? Oh, my name's Alice and I do apologise if I've caused you any offence. Nah, not at all, said the white rabbit. I presumed you'd come to join the tea party. Tea party? asked Alice. I know nothing of that. Oh, said the rabbit. It's being held in my warren by my good friend the Mad Hatter. Would you like to attend? Why, yes, that sounds fantastic, replied Alice. It's very kind of you to invite me. Very well, said the white rabbit. I won't be joining you for a while, cos I've got things to attend to here, but send the Mad Hatter my regards and tell him I'll catch up with him later. In you go, bon voyage, he added before prodding Alice with his walking stick, thus sending her careering down the rabbit hole, which appeared to be about a mile long. screamed the petrified Alice, who eventually landed safely on a huge polka dot sofa in the large rabbit warren, which she noted had black and white pinstripe wallpaper, very similar to that of the white rabbit suit. Oh, here, yeah, missus, here, yeah, yeah. oh, here, who are you while you're at home? asked the mad March Hare, who was sitting on a polka dot chair just inches away from Alice. He wore an ill-fitting black suit and he wore a large crooked top hat that looked like it had seen better days. My name's Alice and I was invited to the tea party by the White Rabbit. In fact, he pushed me down the hole with his stick, which is how I found myself here, explained Alice. Oh, 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 do I see, yes, I see, yes, yes, I see, yes, said the Mad March Hare. Well, welcome to the tea party. My name is the Mad Hatter. Would you like some tea? He inquired. 
and without waiting for an answer, he poured cups of tea from a psychedelic teapot. There you go, there you go, get that down you go. Oh yes! And help yourself to cucumber sandwiches. <laughs> They're absolutely delicious. Why thank you, she said. As Alice politely nibbled on the cucumber sandwiches and drank the tea, the Mad Hatter got up and fixed her with a crazy stare. Oh, where, where on earth is my good friend, the White Rabbit? The teapot is incomplete without him. Oh, I, I nearly forgot. I have a message from the White Rabbit. He says he has things to attend to, but he will see you all later. Oh, this, oh no, this is ridiculous, said the Mad Hatter. Nobody but you has turned up. I feel everyone here in Wonderland has snubbed me. Yes, yes, they're all rude and inconsiderate. Wonderland? asked Alice curiously. Yes, yes, Wonderland. I feel so lit down. No one's turned up to my tea party apart from you. He banged his fists on the table several times during his childish tantrum. Alice became a little concerned and she headed for the nearby door. Where do you hear? Hey, hey, stop, 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 stop. Where, where, where do you think you're going? shouted the Mad Hatter. And I haven't finished my tantrum yet. Oh, I'm just heading out for a breath of fresh air. I'll be back soon, Alice said politely as she left the rabbit run, closing the door firmly behind her. Outside the warren, Alice found herself in a strange forest full of creatures she had never seen before, such as a large caterpillar smoking a huge pipe and a dodo that up to now she would believed was an extinct bird. Alice started trundling through the forest until she spotted two young boys who were performing a strange dance to music emanating from a nearby gramophone. Alice approached the boys, who both had strange tall tufts of hair sprouting from the top of their heads. Excuse me, said Alice. I, I wonder if you could help me. The two boys stopped dancing and they stared at Alice with excitement in their eyes. Hello, said the first young boy. My name's Tweedledee. Oh, my name's Tweedledum, said the second boy. How can we help you? We will if we can. Perhaps she's here to give us a recording contract, said Tweedledee. Yeah, that's it. We have been discovered for our talent at last, said Tweedledum. Not only do we sing, we dance, and according to others, we have the wow factor. The wow factor? What do you mean, the wow factor? Well, we're in a band, said Tweedledee. It's not a band, it's a duo, said Tweedledum. All right, there's no need to pick hairs, said Tweedledee. I'm not picking hairs, I'm splitting hairs, replied Tweedledum. Calm down, boys, calm down, said Alice. You both seem fascinating. What's the name of your act? The name of our act is... Deadwood! Oh, said Alice. That's an interesting name. How did you get that? Someone called us that in a local magazine, said Tweedledee. That's right, said Tweedledum. We're not sure what it means, but it has got a sort of ring to it, don't you think? Yes, said Alice. It's a very interesting name. Oh, it was my idea to use the name, said Tweedledee. No, it wasn't. It was me. I had the idea, said Tweedledum. Right, that's it. Let's have a battle, said Tweedledee. Well, within seconds, the two of them were having a mighty brawl. Feeling uncomfortable, Alice sloped off across a meadow until she came to a large wall. To her disbelief, on the wall sat a huge egg-like creature who had kind eyes and a crooked smile. Hello, he said, and who, pray, are you, little girl? Oh, my name is Alice, she replied, adding, I hope you can help me. I'm lost. Well, I'm sorry, but I can't help you at all, said the creature. My name is Humpty Dumpty, and I'm due to have a great fall, said the creature. In fact, you're just in time to witness it. I hope you're not too disturbed by what you see, because it's my party piece. He then took a deep breath and said, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Then he toppled from the wall and landed on the ground, smashing into tiny pieces. 
Indeed, he was a large egg, for Alice witnessed a sea of yellow yolk emerging from the shattered pieces of eggshell. Suddenly, Alice heard horses approaching. In no time at all, an army of knights on horseback had surrounded her. I think I have an idea who you might be, said Alice. One of the horses replied, We're all the king's horses and all the king's men, and we're here to put Humpty together again. Oh, said Alice. That's not how it goes in the nursery rhyme. Don't believe everything you read, said a sinister-sounding man, who introduced himself as the Red Knight. As the others started to piece Humpty together again, the Red Knight grabbed and alarmed Alice. He then placed her on the back of his horse and took her to a huge palace that belonged to the Queen of Hearts. I think I found a knave of hearts accomplice, said the Red Knight. She fits the description perfectly. The Queen of Hearts stared at Alice and said, Sir, it was you who helped steal the tarts from I, the Queen of Hearts. She turned to a menacing looking executioner and she screamed, A quick-thinking Alice started to scarper out of the room. Get her! Immediately! Off with her head! Screamed the Queen. The Red Knight and the Queen's Executioner started to chase Alice through a maze of corridors. Get her! Get her! Off with her head! Where's she gone? Luckily, Alice lost her predators by hiding behind a suit of armour. As she emerged from behind the armour, Alice was greeted by a large, grinning cat. <laughs> yeah, you must be Alice. I've been inspecting you. I am the Cheshire Cat, and I can help you get home. Oh, cool. Thank you so much, said Alice. Oh, no problem at all, purred the Cheshire Cat. The Cheshire Cat took Alice to a huge study. On the wall was a massive looking glass. Now, Gaze into the looking glass, said the Cheshire Cat. As Alice did so, she spotted an image of the white rabbit standing by the rabbit hole. Come on, come on, come on! Move towards the mirror, said the cat enticingly. As Alice walked towards the looking glass, she discovered she was able to walk straight through it. And suddenly... She found herself standing next to the white rabbit on the grass verge, next to the rabbit hole. Oh, you're back, said the white rabbit. Did you enjoy the Mad Hatter's tea party? <laughs> An astonished and relieved Alice replied politely. Yes, it was very, uh, uh, it was a very fascinating experience. But I must get home to my mother. She'll be wondering where I've been. Oh, very well, said the white rabbit. I think I'll go and join the Mad Hatter now. And without a buy your leave, the white rabbit disappeared down the rabbit hole, never to be seen again. With a fee fa fo and a hey and a ho and a fiddle and a diddle and a rhyme the tale you're gonna hear happened such a long time ago Once upon a time Once upon a time With a fee fa fo and a hey and a ho And a fiddle and a diddle and a rhyme The tale you're gonna hear happened such a long time ago Once upon a time once upon a time This is the story of Rumpelstiltskin. Once upon a time, there lived a beautiful girl named Gwendolyn, whose father, Jeremiah, was a very boastful man. He often boasted about his daughter to impress his neighbours. One of his tales was that his daughter could spin straw into gold. One day, King Henry, the greedy ruler of the kingdom, heard about this gift and he summoned Gwendolyn to the palace. (music) 
When she arrived, she curtsied to the king. He said, I gather that you can spin straw into gold. If this turns out to be true, Gwendolyn, I will grant you permission to marry my son Edward, the prince, and you will live happily ever after. However, if it is proven that the rumour your father has put around my kingdom is a lie, you will pay with your life, my dear. Knowing her father had told a lie, poor Gwendolyn burst into tears. The royal manservant was ordered to take Gwendolyn to a dark and dingy room in the attic, where she found a loom and several bales of hay. The king is expecting you to make all that hay into gold by nine o'clock tomorrow morning, so you had better get cracking, missy. Oh, and by the way, good luck, said the manservant before locking the door behind him. Knowing she was unable to fulfil the task, poor Gwendolyn began to sob uncontrollably. But suddenly, an odd little green man appeared through a waft of mist that had seeped through the keyhole. Good evening, little girl. Why are you crying so? he asked. It's the king. He's expecting me to weave this straw into gold by the morning. If I fail, I'm going to pay with my life cried the sad little girl. Oh, don't worry about that, said the strange little chap, because I can do that for you, no problem. Tickety-boo. Oh, by the way, the name's Rumble Stiltskin. I'm honoured to help you out. Oh, that's very kind of you, said Gwendolyn. Ah, but wait, I do expect something in return. After all, I'm saving your life. I'll tell you what. You give me the pearl necklace you're wearing, then I'll spin this straw into gold straight away. Rumpelstiltskin was as good as his word. All that night he sat at the spinning wheel and he spun the straw into gold. When it was daybreak, he called to her. There, I've kept my promise, little girl. Now I must bid you farewell. And he disappeared into a cloud of silver mist. In the morning, when the king inspected the gold, his eyes lit up with greed. You have done remarkable, Gwendolyn, but perhaps you played some clever trick on me. Tonight I will provide you with even more straw, and once again you must convert it into gold, he ordered. That night, as she sat on a stool in front of the spinning wheel, Gwendolyn cried with fear. Oh, how am I going to convert this straw into gold without Rumpelstiltskin, she said aloud to herself. Then, as had happened the night before, a mist floated through the keyhole and Rumpelstiltskin appeared. Good evening, little girl. Don't tell me the king has told you to convert that straw into gold. If you wish, I will do what I did last night, but I will need something from you in return. Rumpelstiltskin pointed to her finger. That diamond ring you're wearing, that should do the job nicely. Tickety-boo! Gwendolyn sadly handed over her ring. All that night, Rumpelstiltskin sat at the wheel, spinning the straw into gold, whilst Gwendolyn slept. <laughs> there you are, said Rumpelstiltskin. Now, gotta be going. Tickety-boo! And he disappeared. In the morning, King Henry was thrilled when he inspected the gold. You have done so well, my dear, but tonight I will leave you with even more straw. If you succeed in converting all of the straw into gold, not only will your life be spared, but you shall marry my son, Prince Edward, he said with a greedy glint in his eyes. Once again, Gwendolyn was left in the dingy room to weep. Oh, oh no, oh, I do hope Rumpelstiltskin's going to come and help me, she cried. Sure enough, through the keyhole came the waft of mist that transformed into her funny little green companion. Wow, that's a lot of straw, said Rumpelstiltskin. I suppose you want me to weave it into gold, do you? Well, of course, but I'm afraid I have nothing to give you, sir said Gwendolyn, as she burst into tears again. Listen, don't worry, don't worry, I've got an idea, said Rumpelstiltskin. Once I've spun the gold, the king will be so impressed, he'll organise the marriage between you and Prince Edward. But why you, why you want in return? asked Gwendolyn. I have just one condition. 
I want you to promise to give me your firstborn child. It's a fair deal, as I am saving your life, said Rumpelstiltskin with a mischievous grin. Once more the little green man sat spinning the straw into gold until dawn. Then he disappeared into the mist. In the morning, the king was so impressed that he took Gwendolyn to his son, and the pair were married the very next day. Luckily, Gwendolyn got on very well with Prince Edward, and soon they had a baby son. All was going well until one day when Gwendolyn was in the nursery rocking her son in the cradle, when a familiar mist seeped through the keyhole and manifested itself into Rumpelstiltskin. I'm back! I'm back to claim the child as promised. Tickety-boo! He said with a look of menace in his eye. Now, a quick-thinking Gwendolyn said, I am a woman of my word, but I would like to spend some more time with my child before I hand him over. Oh, very well. But I'll be back in two days. Have him ready for me. Tickety-boo! Said Rumpelstiltskin, and he disappeared. Thinking quickly, Gwendolyn hid her beloved child in a private wing of the palace. The following day, she persuaded a local fairground owner to sell her a baby troll, which had huge claws, a wart-ridden face and a set of fangs that weren't for the faint-hearted. She placed the troll in her son's cradle, and she waited. Just as he had promised, Rumpelstiltskin once again manifested himself through the keyhole. Your child awaits you in the cradle, Mr. Stiltskin. Look after him well, for he is a very special boy, said Gwendolyn. Excellent, said Rumpelstiltskin, as he leaned over to snatch the baby. But as he looked into the cradle, the wart-ridden troll gazed up, growling, and he bit Rumpelstiltskin with his large fangs. That'll teach you, you little green creep, said Gwendolyn. Rumpelstiltskin's fright quickly turned into wild rage and he started to have a huge tantrum. First, he stamped his feet on the ground, hurting his foot so badly he began staggering around with a bad limb. I've been tricked, screamed Rumpelstiltskin. I'm going to get you for this, Gwendolyn. But he was so, so very angry that he turned from green to red and finally he exploded! Poor Mr. Rumpelstiltskin, he was reduced to a little pile of dust. The next day, Gwendolyn returned the baby troll to the fairground owner and got some of her money back. And then she went back to the palace to be reunited with her beloved son, who in time, of course, grew up to become the king. You're gonna hear happened such a long time ago Once upon a time Once upon a time This is the story of the hare and the tortoise Once upon a time, in a forest far away There lived a hare called Harry It was a very boastful hare And very proud that he could outrun all of his fellow woodland creatures 
<laughs> I'm the fastest creature in the forest by far. Yeah, no one can outrun me. <laughs> How do you know you're the fastest? Asked Wurzel the Weasel. Yeah, one day he's going to come unstuck with your boasting, so you are. <laughs> he's right, said Cheryl the Chipmunk. One day, all that sure enough's going to backfire on you. But I'll have to admit, you're a very fast runner indeed. Oh, I know that, said the hare. That's why none of you creatures want to challenge me to a race. Then suddenly, a tortoise called Ozzy stepped forward. Hang uh, about, mate, hang about. I'll, I'll challenge you to a race, Harry. I'm sure if I tried on, I, I could outrun you. <laughs> laughed Harry the Hare. Yeah, of all the creatures in the forest, I would hardly have expected you to challenge me to a race. Yeah, but of course, I, I, I'll accept your challenge. Yeah, yeah, but I'm going to win hands down and you're going to be humiliated. <laughs> he said with a very smug grin on his face. I will arrange the race, said Brucey the Barn Owl. I suggest everyone gathers by the babbling brook to witness the race between the, 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 the hare and the tortoise. Well, the next day, all the woodland creatures met at the babbling brook. Harry the hare and Ozzy the tortoise both stood by the brook as Brucey announced the rules of the race. Nice to see you, to see you. Nice! Good game, good game, good game. <laughs> After I say ready, steady, go, the race will commence, <laughs> said Brucey. The hare and the tortoise will race all, all the way to the old oak tree and then back to the babbling brook. The first one back will be the winner and he will receive his golden trophy, which I have prepared. And he held up a golden cup, which looked very impressive indeed. <laughs> said Ronnie Woodpecker. That trophy looks amazing. <laughs> it certainly does. I wonder who's going to win, said Cheryl the chipmunk. Well, we're soon going to find out, said Brucey. Then he uttered the words, Ready, steady, go! Within about 30 seconds, the enthusiastic hare was out of sight. Ozzy the tortoise, on the other hand, was incredibly slow to get going. Come on, Ozzy, give me a best shot. <laughs> said Ronnie. Yeah, come on, go for it, son. We don't want Harry the hare to win. He's far too boastful, said Cheryl. When Harry the Hare reached the oak tree, he said to himself, <laughs> Yeah, 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 I'm winning with such ease. Yeah, it's simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to give that stupid tortoise a chance. In fact, I'm going to have a little nap. Yeah. As Harry the Hare took his 40 winks, he dreamt of winning the magnificent prize. He could almost hear the crowd cheering as Brucey presented him with the golden cup, which he was holding up to his cheering fans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, fans, said the hare in his dream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I told you I was the fastest of them all. Yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, as Harry the Hare continued to dream of his newfound fame spreading across the globe, Ozzy trundled along to the old oak tree. Then he steadily headed back to the babbling brook. Remarkably, the modest tortoise reached the finishing destination before Harry the Hare had finished his dream. The crowd whooped and cheered with delight. They were so loud, they managed to wake up Harry the Hare from his deep sleep. At first, Harry thought that all the cheering he could hear in the distance was still part of his amazing dream. Thank you, thank you, yeah, thank you, thank you once again, my fans, thank you, he said. But then he began to realise he was wide awake and somehow he had managed to lose the race. <laughs> Harry the Hare ran back to the babbling brook just in time to witness Ozzy the tortoise being presented with the golden cup. <laughs> it's not fair, shouted Harry. Ozzy the tortoise cheated. Yeah, I, I can assure you, he, he didn't get as far as the old oak tree. He just turned around. I saw it with my own two eyes. You are so wrong, said Brucey. I was checking with my telescope to make sure that nobody was cheating. 
Ozzy the tortoise has won fair and square, proving once and for all that the forest has got talent. Yeah, quite right, said Ronnie. The talent in this case is Ozzy the tortoise. As for Harry the hare, he needs a good spell in the boot camp. Little do her. I couldn't agree more. There's nothing worse than a cheat and a liar, said Cheryl the chipmunk. I'm no cheat. This is a fix. I am the fastest woodland creature in the forest, and deep down you know it. Yeah, said Harry the hare. Well, there's only one thing I simply can't bear, and that is a bad loser, remarked Brucey. And as Ozzy the tortoise did the lap of honour around the forest, with his golden trophy in his hand, Harry the hare slunk away, never to be seen again. Uh, th this is the best day of my life, said Ozzy the tortoise, and his newfound fans continued to cheer with all their might. Hello, Brucey the Barn Owl here with my final thought. Never be boastful like Harry the Hare, for he came a right cropper because he became so complacent he just couldn't compare to a triumphant tortoise called Ozzy. To be confident's fine, but one must draw the line. Don't be arrogant, there's no excuse. Don't show off or proclaim just for glory and fame. Take my word, I'm a bar now called Bruce. <laughs> Take good care of yourselves and each other. You're gonna hear happened such a long time ago Once upon a time Once upon a time